That gathering is good, but we're going to be talking about a bad gathering followed by a good gathering. And it might seem as though, what do we have to say about the golden calf that we haven't heard? That's one of the most familiar stories in the uh, Old Testament, in the Torah. Well, I'm hoping to share with you that um, as we go through this account, now it looks like I'm going to have to do that. Okay. These books, the first five books of Moses are called the Pentateuch, if you want to use the Greek name, Torah, if you want to be Hebrew. But there's a structure. You'd say, well, I've read the account. I know what's in there. I wanted to share with you some of the exciting things that are uh, set down in the scripture about the underlying structure that helps us to focus on where the important lessons are, even in a story as familiar as uh, that of the golden calf. And uh, to begin, I'm going to start with a definition. So I'm glad we're starting early in the morning. Everybody's bright and cheery. And uh, most of us have probably not heard this word before, chiasm. I hadn't heard it till about a year ago. Uh, or that's the Greek term for it that uh, is called atbesh if you're in the Hebrew community. But this is known by those who study in detail the uh, books of the Old Testament because they see this structure. Of course, it shows up in our Lord's words in Matthew. And you have to remember, Matthew is different from every other book of the New Testament. Why? because it's the only one that originally was written in the language of the Lord and the apostles. It was written in Aramaic, and we have most of the time a Greek translation. The Syriac church does a beautiful job if you want to look at the Aramaic, ask me. But our Lord used this structure all the time because this goes all the way back. The first chiasm you can find in the Bible is the Lord Jehovah speaking right after the flood. But we're going to go focus on the Lord Jesus, where he says this, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And then there's a nested thought here. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And this sort of structure was ancient in the teachings that were used throughout the Mideast. We don't really use it uh, in European uh, society that um, we're descended from, but it is. it goes back to the earliest written records of the societies in that area. <clears throat> Here is a structure that takes you from Exodus 24 all the way to Exodus 40. And take a look at how this nests. Um, first, we find in Exodus 24:18. Uh, and but we're going to go up, we're going to back up a little earlier, but we find that there's a cloud on the mountain. And Moses can enter this cloud. Uh, we find that the Lord tells him the detailed instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, this will include everything about the dimensions, materials of construction, the garments uh, for the priests that are going to be attending, uh, the details about even uh, how the special stones of the breastplate, including the Urim and Thummim, and the uh, incense that's going to be used, the anointing oil, all that's laid out in this commissioning of the tabernacle, which is not the construction. This is just the instructions that uh, Moses receives. After that, the Lord says, the Sabbath is important. You need to keep the Sabbath. No servile work that day. No kindling of a fire that day. Then, Moses is close to 40 days up on the mountain. And 
murmur started amongst the people. Who, who, who can live on that mountain for 40 days? We, we, we don't have a word from him. We, we don't have a signal from him. We haven't seen Moses. And there's a whole there's a whole set of lessons in the Bible that I think are very important about what happens when good people get sucked up into a mob. Okay, uh, we can take an example from the grasshoppers. The green grasshoppers, the science community, bless their hearts, has studied this in detail. If they get so close that they rub their back legs and they've timed it out at something like six to 10 seconds of back leg rubbing, they change color to brown, they start to mass and they become what we call locusts. Okay, this is mob, this is a picture like of mob activity and I believe that shows up in the uh, New Testament book of Revelation where it speaks about the Nicolaitans. There's a lot of stuff written about them that's not good scholarship. The Nicolaitans, I think, are a picture of mob activity uh, in, in um, uh, but here's the first example that we have in the Bible. So the people gathered against Aaron. Uh, that Hebrew word, and um, I have it written down, I think it's, so why, why should I memorize the number? Uh, but it's, it's written down. Um, but it's the word, uh, it's, it's the word uh, kahel. They gathered against Aaron. And this begins a whole focus on the golden calf. This ends in Exodus 35, 1, when that same verb is used, kahel. Uh, for Moses gathering all the people after everything's gotten straightened out. And uh, we're going to step through how this structure works, but for those of you who can see the visual, uh, this is not just randomly accounting what took place with the people. There is a distinct structure taking you from chapter 24 to chapter 40. And we're going to burrow down into the structure of what's happening around the golden calf incident itself. This was a turning point for Israel. This almost resulted in their annihilation, as we recall the story. So let's take a look. Um, I'm going to expand on that area, Exodus 32 to 34, um, there's what we're calling chiasm. I don't, if you want afterwards, I can give you why they gave that name. But there's actually seven nested themes within uh, this 32, 1 to 35, 1. And, and I'm going to highlight it. The first one is the gathering of the people. In this case, the gathering of the mob and gathering it in a bad way. It became clear that they would settle for nothing less than a visible God. Now they called that God Jehovah. Boy, that, you know, that, that's adding salt, that's putting salt in the wound. You know, they already knew that they should not have idols, but no. They uh, had this delaying action by Aaron where, you know, the people were doing the celebratory crazy thing that uh, some who have just been brought into liberation do. They had been enslaved, and as they were leaving Egypt, we recall that uh, the Egyptians who were totally, um, you know, they were bereaved. Every family had probably lost uh, a firstborn, okay? So any family with a firstborn son had lost a firstborn. 
They were bereaved. They were exhausted. The land was devastated. They were demoralized. And what did they do? They gave the jewelry to, uh, uh, to the people of Israel as uh, reparations for their enslavement years. And what did the people do? Well, if you, if you actually look at how slaves dressed, it was very simple. It was not with uh, jewelry and golden earrings and that. But here, everybody had on, men, men too, you know, had on their earrings and uh, necklaces. All of that was the exuberance of a people that have not yet come into a sanctified relationship with Jehovah. So Aaron starts by saying, okay, take, take off the gold. This wasn't a big sacrifice, but take off that gold. We're going to melt it down. You know, uh, they had a wood frame. Uh, they melted the gold down, beat it out into thin sheets and covered everything over. So this is the people gathering and the people were gathering because they said, what has happened to Moses? We can't see Moses. That was, that was one of the things that bothered them. Did you know, if you actually take a look, uh, there's four verses about the golden calf having ordinances. Wow. I mean, wasn't it enough to just say there was this heathen idol that was a disgrace to the uh, affirmation by the people, all these things we'll do? And, and there you have, you have man, you have mankind. You know, we have mankind moving forward thinking, oh, what I'm doing is for life, but the reality is it just brought the condemnation upon them. And so um, we're told about uh, the golden calf, we're told that he had an altar, we're told that there were sacrifices, uh, feasting, and then um, the Bible uses uh, euphemistic terms. Uh, there was really a lot of uh, lascivious converting going on during this feasting. And of course, uh, Moses and, and Joshua, remember Joshua and Moses were permitted by the Lord to go past the boundary markers that were a marker of death, any animal, or any person that went beyond those was to be uh, thrust through with a dart or stoned. And uh, they had the permission of the Lord to go beyond, approach the mountain itself, which is covered with a cloud. And uh, Joshua was staying near the base, but Moses made the ascent into that. And then, uh, you know, we had this assembly taking place of the people. Well, the Lord gave Moses the tables of the law now written in stone with his own finger. And Moses was descending the mountain, and the Lord said, um, um, Moses, the people have sinned a great sin, and informed him of everything that was taking place. The Lord said, let me consume these people and I will make of you a great nation. The lesson that uh, we need to take from this, and uh, Pastor Russell talks about this in uh, the reprint uh, reference that I, by the way, this is printed out and you'll be able to have it afterwards. Um, we are the greater mediator than Moses by grace. If we make our calling and election sure, and as we look at Moses dealing with the people, we need to really take these lessons into our hearts. Would we, would we do what Moses did and say, if you have wrath, 
take it out on me. Would we go and say, as Moses said, uh, because if if you get into the text, the Lord says, your people are sinning. You know, thy people are sinning. And Moses very politely says (laughs) something totally outrageous. Why should the Lord be angry? Why should the Lord be angry? And um, uh, it's, it's, you must have said, um, uh, what do you mean, why should I be angry? But Moses approached the Lord saying, now look, thy people, Moses tosses it back. Don't call them my people, they're thy people. He says, we know that they have a lot of education essentially to do. We know that this is going to be a long process. We know there's going to be mistakes. Those are lessons that you and I need to take in because, um, you know, sometimes it's like, well, how's this problem going to be taken care of? Well, it's going to be taken care of in the kingdom. That's true. That's not how it's going to be taken care of. It's going to be a challenge for some of those coming back uh, in the resurrection to uh, find uh, their way onto the highway of holiness with all the helps and the removal of the obstacles, the uh, removal of the beasts that will uh, be devouring, you know, Satan and his minions. Even so, the kingdom is going to be a time with a lot of challenges that are going to um, require us to be like Moses, require the greater than Moses to be like Moses. So Moses entreats the Lord. He doesn't, he says, you know, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now he doesn't say, how is that promise to them going to work? But you know, let's talk about that. Uh, uh, that's going to be uh, a, a promise that might look as though it's not fulfilled. And then he says, look at the public relations. And it's like, you know, I could see the Lord say, I really don't care what the Egyptians think of me. But Moses says, you have become significant in the eyes of this people in Egypt. They know that the Lord is God. And now if you draw the people out into the wilderness and you consume them, they're going to say, huh, well, that's the kind of God that the Hebrews worship good riddance to them. There are lessons in this book of Exodus about mediatorship that need to be our lessons. Moses, of course, takes those tablets and he shatters them. Now we don't have any record, but it seems as though he took control of the camp again with no problem at all. Everybody, you know, kind of like backed off. He came to the foot of the mountain and Joshua says, you know, Uh, This is terrible. It sounds like the camp is under attack. And Moses has been through everything with the Lord. He says, no, no, the camp isn't under attack. The people are sinning greatly. And he brought he brought his uh, uh, most trusted lieutenant up to speed on what had happened. And then uh, got a hold of the uh, golden calf. Of course, he had that burned ground everything up uh, into a fine powder, strawed it upon the water, and said, drink it. Okay, you want golden calf? We'll give you golden calf. Drink the golden calf. Um, uh, The Levites joined up with him and were told that they had their swords ready, and he sent them through the people, and there were 3,000 of the ringleaders who were killed. We're told about that. Um, 
The Lord wasn't satisfied. The Lord said, I'm still going to be taking vengeance on those that participated who were not slain by the sword. And so he sent a plague. And I have some ideas on the plague, but um, uh, that was a continuing uh, that that was a continuing um, issue. And then Moses has to talk with Aaron. <clears throat> now, what do you do if you're Aaron and you've really, really, really goofed up and, and been participating in this? Well, Aaron doesn't have any explanation. I mean, this is like one of the most famous stupid things in the Bible. And that's why the Bible is the word of God because it shows people as they actually are. So, well, you know, we tossed the gold into the fire, melted it, and the golden calf came out. So there's the explanation. Uh, there was a dear sister, you know, who said, oh, well, that must have been what happened. It's like, no, 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 this is not what happened. This is, this is not what happened. Uh, it, this is just like, I have, you know, David would have done something different. Like, I sinned greatly. Uh, forgive me, you know, uh, Aaron, uh, however, learned a lesson from this. And that's an important thing for us to know as mediators in the kingdom. There is going to be a lot of really major goof ups by people during the kingdom. People who should know better, people who should, uh, you know, who might be looked to in positions of uh, leadership, and um, um, it's going to be a learning experience. So uh, Aaron is not smitten down. The Lord didn't uh, plague him. The Lord didn't have him slain. The Lord said, okay, did you learn your lesson? And that's an important um, thing for us to recognize. Things don't end for the downhill issues with um, Israel at this point. <clears throat> Let's see, I just had that a second. There we go. Let's move forward. Because the Lord says, you know, I'm not going to lead anymore. He says, if I lead this people, something like this is going to happen again. I'm going to, you know, have my righteous indignation. I'll destroy them in the way. <clears throat> This really brings us almost to the core of 16 chapters in, in this book. Because Moses says, if you're not going to lead us, don't take us anywhere. If you're going to send, send, have your angel lead us and you're not going to directly lead us, I'm not going to be going anywhere people aren't going to be going anywhere. And so the Lord changes his mind and says, to Moses, Moses says, if I found grace in your sight, Show me the way. And the Lord says, I know you by name. Of course the Lord knew Moses by name. What does that mean? It's, it's a special promise, brethren. And it's a special thing as though, you know, to give, I, I love the example that came up from uh, Brother Christie at our uh, study. He said, you know, it would be one thing for you to say, I know the name of the President of the United States. The President of the United States says, I know your name. That means he's going to take your, 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 your phone calls when you, when you uh, call him up. And that's the case over here. This four verses in Exodus 33, 16, 12 to 16 is, uh, I want to read those. Let's, let's all turn together in our Bibles to that um, Exodus 33 because I didn't put it up on the PowerPoint. By the way, if you want to be in a Hebrew congregation, this is Shmot. It's the book of names. 
uh, not Exodus, the way forward, which is a Greek name. <clears throat> Moses said unto the Lord, this is 33, 12. Thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in thy sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. This is the turning point in the whole account. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, uh, that's Jehovah, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up from hence. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> now in the Jewish community, they say, you know, we Jews are different from you Christians because I'm getting good relations with them. And uh, it's like, we argue if we're not happy. It's like, we accept everything, you know, and, and it's like, well, here you have it. Uh, of course, we're operating under a different covenant and trying to see and understand and work through the Lord's will. But um, the Lord says in 16, for wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? If you don't go up with us, I mean, we're, we're looking at a reasoned argument here between Moses and the creator of the universe. And we shall be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken. For thou hast gained grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. That is the focus of 16 chapters. Everything is going to go in a positive direction from this point forward. It doesn't mean the people aren't going to make terrible mistakes, but it means that Jehovah is never again going to threaten the people with annihilation and uh, uh, I mentioned uh, them having all this jewelry on. Boy, when the people, Moses actually made three ascents of the mount to bring us to this point. This is the third ascent that he makes uh, to try to negotiate between Jehovah and the people. And at this point, when he came back and told the people, you know, Jehovah is no longer going to lead us because he says, if I lead you and you do something stupid and sinful like this again, I'm just going to annihilate you on the way. It's going to happen because this is where you're at. And the people at that point mourned to the extent that they were told they tore off the rest of their uh, jewelry and got rid of it. You know, all of that didn't get thrown away because they were going to be using it now in the tabernacle. So this set of structures brings us to the focal point of Exodus. These verses, actually it says 16, it should be 17, uh, but 17 is kind of in between. So now we're going to go back. If we read from 17 uh, to 23, the Lord says, okay, once again, I'm going to lead. And here we have then, uh, Moses keeps pushing and he says, can you show me yourself? Wow. The Lord says, no man can see my face and live, but we're going to put you, there's a cleft of the rock here, put you in, I'll cover you with my hand, and you'll be able to see my afterwards. Believe me, the commentators, the sages, Christian and Jewish have been all over the place. We don't know what it means. But anyway, that's, he saw something of the Lord's afterwards, his glory. And things have changed from this point. But do you notice how this nests 
with the thought that the angel would lead, first thing we have is, nope, the Lord's going to lead. That is a chiasm. Oops, that's not the direction I wanted. That's right, I'm moving backwards in my slide. The next thing is, you know, there's a principle. If you, if you mess it up and break it, you fix it. So the Lord says, hew out a set of tablets like the first ones and write out the law on it. We want that to be part of the uh, ark. You know, so there's this, there's this general principle there. The tablets of the law are restored, and the Lord said, I'm going to show grace to this people. Things are moving in a good direction now. Whereas he'd said in the, in the nested structure, in the chiasm, that I'm going to consume the people and make of thee a great nation, now he says, I'm going to consume these nations of the land, the Canaanites, and make this people a great nation. So there's the closing thought uh, that, that nests uh, from uh, the uh, 34, 10 to 17. What do we have next? Next, again, there's a nested response, whereas we'd seen the ordinances of the golden calf covering four verses, we now have 10 verses saying, these are some of the highlights of the law, and I want three holy assemblies a year, just as a suggested possibility for your consideration. We notice that uh, Moses had to ascend the mount three times. Is that the connection? I don't know. But the Lord lays out that I want to see everybody assembling three times a year. Something changed in Moses when he had this interaction with, with Jehovah. Um, the Hebrew literally said that there were horns. Well, of course, the sense should be shown, but if you go and look at medieval pictures uh, and Renaissance pictures of Moses, he's got little horns on his head because that's what the the uh, Old Testament said that's what uh, St. Jerome put into the, into the uh, Vulgate. But the people now were afraid to look at Moses. Remember the problem at first was we can't see him? <laughs> this closes out with, we're afraid to see Moses. Uh, you know, so there's this whole account of him putting the veil on his face. And then... Moses gathers the people. This closes out the whole golden calf episode. And uh, where do we go? Well, we find that there's workplace rules. The, the construction immediately began on the tabernacle? No. Sabbath, by the way, of course, that exactly nests as a chiasm. The Sabbath is implemented here. And um, I like the thought that uh, you really can't be creative if you're working all the time. You do need that downtime. And it's thought that uh, with the Sabbath, uh, uh, Jehovah created the idea of resting from creative action. When I'm with my uh, uh, son-in-law and daughter uh, who are um, Orthodox uh, Jews, uh, I turn off the cell phone and the, don't access the computer, that sort of thing. And really it is kind of refreshing to take, take, take a uh, break. Uh, and, and you know, I don't do the driving either. You walk around and of course you, you're talking with the friends and neighbors and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's quite relaxing. Then you had the whole construction of the tabernacle, which, as you might recall, gets commissioned on Nisan 1. So when did they leave? They left, you know, on the Passover, right? Okay, so that's the night of Nisan 14. They leave, they're leaving the next day. So almost one year within two weeks of when they had the Passover 
the, the uh, tabernacle gets commissioned on Nis construction and commissioned. And now the Lord shows his presence and blessing of this new arrangement by having a cloud. But this cloud is not like the cloud Moses could enter. This is a cloud Moses cannot enter. Brethren, in each of these sections, there are spiritual lessons for us as those who are going to be part of this great mediator by God's grace. Let us take those into our heart.